Chapter 7. The Quality of Our Education 1. Adapted to Current Needs Our educational mission, that call, which we have been examining throughout these pages, demands quality because it seeks the best for each one and for all. For us, quality in education is achieved not only through the living of gospel values, rooted in the Eucharist, which create communion and fraternity, but also through the application of a good pedagogical system and correct school organization. From the beginnings, there was in the Institute a concern for the quality of education in order to better serve society and the church, Mother Pillar said. I desire that they find no fault with us in the matter of education. Our centers soon enjoyed the esteem and appreciation of the administration and the persons who came into contact with the Institute. We have testimony of this in a document by Mother Pillar in regard to the School of Cordoba. You can't imagine how our schools are taking shape, the one in Cordoba and the one here, and for this reason we are esteemed. Quickly they began to organize and write the reglamentos. Outstanding among these is the one of 1915, which in addition to regulating the life of the school, contains valuable pedagogical observations. The first handmade educators felt the desire to harmonize the structure and the educational style of the centers. They wanted to give them a family atmosphere and to form a united body among themselves. A key figure in these centers was the prefect as much in the schools as in the academies and upon her fell all the responsibility for the formation of the students and the organization of the center for the attainment of its goals. She was the educator par excellence. The constitutions of 1886 assigned her a leading role. The general prefect of studies and the general monitor were two charges which appear, almost from the first, in the reglamentos of the academies. The basic duty of the former was to guide the academic part. The latter was responsible for exterior order and had to be a person of great patience, great prudence and great zeal. With the passage of the years, the centers continued to adjust to the different changes in educational and social needs that arose according to the circumstances, as reflected in the reglamentos de regimen interior. Just as the present-day communities of the educational centers do with their organization and participation, they sought union among all. Although it is certain that our foundresses and the first handmaids began their path in education by instructing in the faith, and above all, with the testimony of their lives, very soon this was extended to encompass other fields, since the approved statutes allowed for different grades of instruction. In the Reglas de las Escuelas sent to Rome by Mother Sacred Heart in 1886 on speaking of the teachers we find. Although religious instruction should take the principal place in the education of the girls, nevertheless ours should not fail to give them knowledge appropriate to their state and to the need that they might have in the future. These are reading, writing, grammar, spelling and arithmetic. Teaching in the academies was much broader. It adjusted to the demands of the era for a specific social class. Thus we see that in the Academy of Caddies they gave, in addition to religion and morality, classes in reading, penmanship, history, sacred as well as world history and history of Spain, Spanish grammar, arithmetic, geography, geometry, and concepts of physics and logic. French and English special care is taken so that the students may be able to play the piano perfectly. In drawing are included oil painting, watercolor and miniatures. In regard to needlework, the students will be instructed in dressmaking, darning, mending, etc., as in plain embroidery, as well as in silk, gold, and all types of lace making. In the centers they continued to improve in organization, soon seeking good quality and appropriate levels of study. In the cultural part of the education of our girls, they should always strive that it be, whenever possible, according to the new need of more extensive and profound instruction which is required by the modern trends in society in regard to women. Toward the 40s, when education was becoming more formalized in many of our centers, these began to be structured in a different way, although continuing to preserve many of the directives and principles of the previous era, Mother Cristina Estrada often repeated, it is necessary that the academies do well, that they be maintained at the level that is required today. It is noteworthy that very soon, as we can see from the reglamentos that are extant, the methodological and pedagogical principles were clear and well-defined. 
one of the first methodological orientations can be found in the previously mentioned rules of the schools in 1886. In the daily instructions that the teachers will give to the girls, the head teacher will not allow them to undertake it without any guide, leaving everything up to inspiration, but will give them for this objective specific catechisms and some other good books, so that after having prepared beforehand what they are going to say and forming their idea, they may then speak with ease and clarity. A few years later, we find in another reglamento this valuable and wise observation for the beginning of the school year. During the first days, deal with the sudden change from rest and enjoyment of family life to the vexing homework of the course and submission to school discipline, which the girls are going through, especially the boarding students, without tolerating notable infractions of discipline overlook some carelessness that may inadvertently happen. There are some brief principles established by our very reverend mother general for the organization of studies, which show the great influence that the ratio studium has had on various aspects of our educational system. Each teacher should have her own method of teaching, but so that the formation of this may more easily adapt itself to the academy, to the girls etc. She should read frequently and assimilate the directory of teaching a series of rules and commentaries inspired by the ratio of the Society of Jesus. In some reglamentos such as this one from 1935, we find up-to-date pedagogical norms such as the following. The girls are extraordinarily active, take advantage of this exuberance to benefit the class. Have them take part in the teacher's explanation with unexpected questions, having them explain what they have heard and give examples that will clarify. In a word, don't let them spend class time in quiet passivity, which is as sterile as it is vexing. In order to awaken interest and ascertain that the students have assimilated the content, they would employ, before 1915, the method of the concertations, debates or competitions. A type of literary or scientific competition, which divides the class into two teams or groups, fosters in the girls a healthy spirit of competition, and along with it what we can call virtues of the classroom, interest, attention, activity, perfect and intelligent assimilation of the material, of which they will attain true mastery, for as they have to argue, defend, etc., they truly need to master it. However, as this material is of such importance, it will be dealt with more carefully, recommending that the teachers study without prejudice this very useful method that is so highly regarded in the ratio studium. Certainly it was a style and method of motivating different from that of today, but it was valid in the aspects of participation, of motivation, and of working in groups, thus improving upon what could have been merely a competition. In our centers these competitions could be of two types, the class concertation and the public concertation. It was a pedagogical method customary for many years, completely inspired by the academies and certain means of the ratio studium. In these same normous complementarias, everything referring to their preparation and development is described in minute detail. However, our centers always kept religious and moral formation as the priority, while maintaining the instruction and education at the level of what was required at every moment, because we believed that if our students are educated in universal values, they would be more able to improve society. It is necessary to know the modern advances in all fields and study them in depth in order to adhere reasonably to the scientific and practical conclusions that follow from them. The teacher will be up to date through conferences, courses etc., which deal with these materials, in order to stay always at the highest level of culture. In 1960, the organization of the academies took effect, setting up guidelines of high caliber in all fields. Several years have gone by since, following the orientations received from the church, we have intensified our efforts to adapt the organization of our academies to the demands of modern society. We already know from experience, in the light of the end, that we propose of forming our students integrally, in both their human and Christian aspects, the relative merits of the different ways of proceeding. Many pedagogical and methodological directives have come down to us from the years between the 40s and the 70s, through Mother Christina Estrada, and from the General Secretariat of Studies, directives which we can consider valid even in our day. Let us examine some of these.
little has been done to promote the development of the girl's abilities, to instill the habits of observation, analysis and synthesis, to teach them to reason and expound their ideas logically, etc. Treatises on pedagogy are in agreement that merely filling children's heads with many ideas is not the way to form them. It is necessary that they be trained in what will be useful for them in life. It is not possible for the girls to study very extensive programs adequately. In our history of education, there exists a complete and very interesting methodology dealing with the ways of explaining the different subjects, and within some limits it recognizes the freedom that each teacher can have within her class. With rare exception, you cannot exact that in class the teachers be limited to a procedure minutely determined in advance, but neither should you allow them so much leeway that they do not take into account what the girls have done in previous courses and what they will be expected to do in subsequent courses. The desire to perfect and adapt the methodology has been constant in the Institute. Today we cannot think in such uniform ways as before, but there are certain principles and methods that are common to all which have their clearest expression in the educational communities. The programs and methods have been adjusting to the demands of the different countries, times and the pedagogical processes which advances in human sciences have developed. Although many aspects of our educational system may have become external symbols or mere memories, we cannot deny the validity that they had in certain moments of history. Our pedagogy was meant to be an open and flexible pedagogy where we have throughout the years experimented with and incorporated various methods and systems according to eras, countries, and centers, emphasizing more and more the dignity of the human person and communion among all. In a world in constant transformation, always keeping in mind respect for the rights of persons, and trying to respond to the calls of the church and of society so that the world may be more just and have more solidarity, our pedagogy today strives for dialogue among faith, culture and life so that this way, the full coherence between faith and the sum of knowledge, values, attitudes and behaviors can result in the personal synthesis of faith in life. As before, we continue to work so that the student may attain the full development of his or her possibilities endeavoring that. The program of learning respond to the interest of the students and connect with their personal experiences, fostering progressive and gradual enrichment of their intellectual structures, fostering the growth of those capacities that prepare the students for access to knowledge throughout their lives. According to the real possibilities of the centers and places, technological advances have been placed at the service of education in order to teach the students to understand the new forms of expression, although an abundance of resources does not automatically lead to learning. Effort and thoroughness are essential. Without doubt our students of the third millennium will need many technological skills, but even more they need to learn to discover and accept gospel values in order to integrate them into a culture of globalization which will emphasize human dignity and communion. Very specific demands that, well directed, can affect the quality of our center the mission that is entrusted to us demands utmost quality, competence, and efficiency, values characteristic of our time. Now, in our centers we want an excellence that is not only academic, but also human, in its fullest sense, a competency that makes them more able to serve, to share, to feel with the weak, an efficiency that has as its criteria respect for the person, the good of the others, and the life of the poor. Once again, in our day, the Institute strives to be faithful to the spirit of the foundresses and to be sensitive to the development and evolution of the world. Methods and forms are revised in order to adjust to the times and to offer a valid response as they did in the beginning to what the church and society need at the moment. Methodologies come and go and are surpassed, but the spirit survives and is identified with the foundational charism. It is this spirit that has to guide our future so that we may be at the service of persons and places in the context of their reality, based on the values of the gospel lived in our mission. Fidelity is dynamic, creative, because the spirit is the creator and finds up-to-date responses to the calls of the church and society in different historic eras.
2. Our educational style. The work of education can be compared in many aspects to the bit of leaven hidden in the dough, which ferments it from within. In order to be that leaven, the educator has to know that her raison d'etre in the center is important, but in line with the evangelizing stance of our education, of the culture that we want to impart. It is fundamental that she be capable of being a sign of the kingdom. This is one of the great challenges. The person of the teacher, from the beginning, has been considered important because of the sensitivity of her mission. Love this holy work very much, Mother Sacred Heart said, and, in 1886, in the rules for teachers contained in the rules of the schools it states. The teacher should have a great esteem for the task that is entrusted to her. They will be vigilant and active, prudent, firm and full of the most tender charity. This vocation demands a specific preparation in order not only to transmit knowledge, but above all to offer the teacher a serene consideration of what she does and why she does it. It is a delicate task, because to educate is an art, it is a second creation. Education is a second creation. To receive the mission of educating is to receive from God an association with God in the divine work. This is the way that the Institute has understood it from the beginnings until now. Therefore education cannot be for us simply a commitment. It is something much deeper, since it is part of our very identity. We have always had the asset of shared work. We do not educate individually or as a group of people, but we do it as a body for the mission where each member is indispensable and carries out an important function of communion, although recognizing that the responsibility entrusted to the teachers is fundamental in the structure of the educational community. All those who in some way have contact with the girls can be considered educators. One can say that none of them, no matter how little her participation in the structure of an academy, lacks influence no matter how superficial the contact, although it may be merely opening the door, monitoring, she, consciously or unconsciously, wields the chisel, and for this reason, influences. Many years later, Sister Rita Burley again insists on the importance of work in the centers supported by the educational community. I want us to continue to take steps to create an educational community, that everything done in the center be done as an educational community, and not as the work of an individual. The handmaids want to live the new ecclesiology, this way of being a church of communion and participation. In the church there is a diversity of charisms, lay, religious, and clergy, with their respective calls. Today, wherever the church is working, it has to be through real communion among the charisms. If it is for us handmaids to make sure that the charismatic spirit of St. Raphaela continues in the schools, we know that we can do this only through and from the educational community, in a shared mission. This desire and conviction has to be incarnated in each center so that it becomes more than just a nice phrase. From all of this we can gather that coherence of life is indicated in the writings of the Institute as an essential quality for educators. Mother Oliver Rina said, We have to live what we teach. We transmit what we are. Let us be what we wish to form. If we are to be educators who offer the wisdom of the gospel and convincing ways and forms, our own lives have to serve as an example. Endeavor that this high esteem for our mission may translate above all into distinguishing ourselves through our example, for this always has a great deal of influence on the girls. Its influence is of incalculable transcendence. After many years, Paul V.I. would echo this idea. Modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers, and if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. However, this work has to be done within relationships of cordiality and approachability, with the students, and with those who form the educational community. In this way, we can offer them ways of love, understanding, fraternity and communion in harmony with all that has been said about the pedagogy of the heart. An indispensable quality in any educator is love for her students. If this love truly exists, that love will make you to seek at every moment what is best for each girl. On your part, there should be much goodness together with firmness, much patience and much forbearance. Never consider anyone a lost cause. All children are good. At times the vein of gold lies beneath the surface, but never very deep. It is a question of working with gentleness and trust, and of waiting.
In the light of our charism of reparation, we should never be disheartened by the major or minor limitations of our students. The educator cannot stay on the surface. She has to go down to the profound level and always understand that her vocation demands a response of communion which comes from the Eucharist. It requires healing with her own hands the large or small wounds that her students may have and offering them the opportunity of beginning anew. It offers a specific help in the most sensitive moments of the developmental stages. To educate means to be patient, to know how to wait, to connect. Only from these givens can we offer valid responses and be able to highlight meaningful experiences in each one's life, which will launch her into a new world. In order for this sensitive task of education to be accomplished successfully, the atmosphere of the center has to be conducive. Here the relationship among the different members of the educational community plays an important role. Simplicity and approachability in a climate of respect for all is indispensable. From this comes, give priority to the overall interests of the educational community above those of an individual or a group. Consider that the attention to the formative needs of the students and the quality of the education are the axis that gives meaning and coherence to all the proposals and decisions. Assume that dialogue, understanding and respect are the habitual ways of reaching agreement. These elements build communion and cannot be supplanted by mere organization of the school, since our centers are not only places where we try to impart a quality education. They have to be, above all, places where we celebrate, with joy and even at times with suffering, the events of all who form the educational community. For the Institute, it is a priority that the school atmosphere foster the creation of the community of faith that a. favors the atmosphere and structures necessary for an open, liberating educative process, b. shares and offers its own values and efforts in a spirit of service, c. is always learning, growing and maturing as a human and Christian group, d. gives witness of its Christian identity. It is the center as a whole which creates the atmosphere, but each one has responsibility in this task. We do not educate merely as individuals. It is the entire school, its atmosphere, which comprises the criteria, the ideals, the desires, the effort, the actions, the entire life of the school. We create the atmosphere by what we say, and still more by what we do, with our individual actions, with the way we deal with one another, and with the children. I would like each one of you to examine herself a bit and see what influence she has on the atmosphere of the school. Do you contribute to its being simple, joyful, friendly, supernatural? Nothing will be achieved without a close union among the educators, without a communion that will translate consistently into words and works all the ideals that are put forth in the center. This has been another of the great principles since the beginnings of the congregation. There are many letters, regulations, educational projects, which insist upon the union of hearts and wills in order to foster the education of our students. In order to do the most possible good, it is necessary that every day we have more positive union made up of goodness of heart, of cooperation, of facility in following the orientation of the one who can give it. How it helps the students to see that we are all united seeking only to do good to them. From the beginnings of the Institute, this desire for unity was one of Rafaela Maria's greatest preoccupations. And now, while we are still at the foundations, let us go down deep, so that the strong winds which come will not be able to demolish our building. All united as one in everything like the fingers on a hand, and thus we shall succeed in anything we do. As a response to the desire of the Church today, we have to work so that our interpersonal relations may not deteriorate due to the functionalism of roles, haste, fatigue and other factors that create conflicting situations. To organize schools like gymnasiums, where one exercises to establish positive relationships between the various members and to search for peaceful solutions to the conflicts is a fundamental objective. Our last general congregation also asks us to be experts in communion. The educational communities are called to be a sign of the communion among students, parents, personnel in the centers, and religious in order to offer to the world the charism of reparation through Christ in the Eucharist. We feel called to create fraternity, communion among reconciled brothers and sisters. This is one of the great challenges which education has for us.
to foster in the school everything that promotes communion. What a Eucharistic challenge, what a contemporary challenge. The stones that were pressed down, who are our foundresses, have allowed us to raise up the building, little by little. The vocation of an educator, as we have seen and savored, is a precious heritage received from them as mission. It is a commitment for a future which demands of us, from our charism of reparation, to continue working in this immense field of education, trusting that we are instruments in the hands of God, because the harvest is great and there are few zealous workers, and the world's needs are many and very great. Conclusion We began this study by saying that no one chooses the time of her life story, but every moment in time has its own generous share of grace, responsibility, and of course limits. Having arrived now at the end of this work on education, especially formal education, in the Institute, we have demonstrated that historical circumstances have been the framework for many of our actions. Our education has been constructed with the materials available at each moment in history. The truly important thing, however, is that we have shown how we handmaids have faced each box challenges from the stance of our charism. We may not be responsible for the difficulties facing us, but we are responsible for our responses. The Institute has not had as its educational objective an unexamined prolongation of the past. Remaining faithful to the charism we have received has been what has given us creative responses to the demands of each moment in order to prepare for and anticipate a future full of promise. We are aware of the fact that the profession of educators today has in many places lost its moral and social prestige, but our greatness, grace, weakness, and risk spring from our reparative mission, which rests upon the solid foundations that we received from our foundresses. Our mission is strengthened by the structure given by our pedagogy of the heart, which is what motivates us to help new generations to grow as persons of integrity, with our presence, word, and support. We cannot allow ourselves to forget this in a day and time that thirsts for a meaningful horizon, no matter how many difficulties we encounter in our world, a world full of values contrary to the gospel. The handmaids of the sacred heart of Jesus and all the people who collaborate in our mission are called to be town triers, seed sowers, encouragers of life, so that through the precious task of education, in service of the gospel, we may be able to continue fine-tuning our awareness of the many types of poverty in today's world. It is our turn now. Our task is to continue sowing with altruism and generosity, without knowing where the seed will take root, without knowing who will reap the harvest. As educators, we want to leave the details to God, who will make the seed come to fruition in the lives of our students, when he desires and how he desires. We cannot forget that the 20th century has come to a close with the open wound of exclusion. Our institute faces new demands and new opportunities in the educational realm, new realities before which we must not remain indifferent. May the Lord grant us the gifts we need to be able to enthusiastically carry forward this crucially important mission of education in service of the gospel. If there is anyone who has to live by gazing with hope upon the future, it is we, the world's educators,